Good evening. Welcome again to Biblical Insights with Bob. Tonight, I want to talk about something that's very current. We're hearing a lot in the church, and I'm not talking about a particular denomination. I'm talking about in the church in general, about a falling away. And a lot of discussion on why and what we can do. But I want to go back to the beginning. Look at the second chapter of the book of Acts. And I want to read a verse or two from there. Acts 2.42, here's a picture of the early church. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking bread and to prayer. Now listen to this. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. That's not the same church we see in a lot of cases today, maybe in a few places. One statement you could say about that early church, it was an exciting place to be. We're not just talking about church services where there was shouting and blessings. We're talking about excitement all around, every day of the week. There were miracles, mighty works. Why is it when we talk about an exciting church today, we generally think about the worship services. When the book of Acts doesn't even mention the worship service as we know them. One person even spoke of the difference between a blessing and a kick. Now, a kick, I'm sure, means kind of an emotional upsurge or a high. So, what's happened to the church? Why can't we get people interested in coming? Why does nothing exciting ever happen there? Now I want us to look at another section of the book of Acts, the very next chapter, I think the very next verse, chapter 3, the verse 10 verses. We'll find six elements that existed in that church that I think gave it that excitement. And I believe these principles will work today. Let's read the scripture. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who'd been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. Now when he saw Peter and John about to go in the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. With a leap he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement and what had happened to him. Let's look at some of those elements. The first thing I noticed as I began to read that was they were going to the temple for an hour of prayer. There was consistent prayer. Now, the book of Acts is full of references to the church at prayer. There's at least and, and I looked this up in my concordance, there are at least 29 references to prayer in 28 chapters. You know, 
in my day. I know and I've been told and seen so many ways. Revivals are always born in prayer. Get that? Revivals are always born in prayer. Now, Dr. E.M. Bounds, who was a devout pastor of the last century, says this, The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost could use, men of prayer, mighty men of prayer. The Holy Ghost doesn't flow through methods, but through men. He doesn't come on machinery, but on men. He doesn't anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. Consistent prayer. We see that. Now, that's the first. The second one, there's a compassionate awareness we find in verse 2 and 3. You notice they said to him, first of all, they fixed their gaze on him. Remember that? In other words, they saw him, but they did just look at him and keep going. They fixed their gaze. They were compassion. Now, he'd been there all the time. He's lame from birth. He's there every day. And he called out to them. Maybe he called out to him every day. Now, they could have taken him for granted and said, uh, what can we do? And they might have said, because they did say, uh, we don't have anything to give him. They might have been too busy being religious. Remember the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite just went by because they were too busy. I have to ask myself, is the church too busy today to see those that are hurting around us. And folks, the world is full of hurting people. Is that compassionate awareness there today? Or is it missing? Second element. Notice the phrase. It said they used to sit down. That was written after he began to walk. They used to set him down. So we need today to be needs-oriented. I remember Dr. Phil, you've heard of Dr. Phil, talked about his key to a successful marriage. It was know what your partner needs and meet it. I think the key to an exciting church is very similar. The church needs to ask, what are the needs in our community and how can we meet them? I'm thankful that I belong to a church who's finding the needs and meeting them. Compassionate awareness. Now, the third element is a compelling witness. Notice the first thing they said, look at us, look at us. Verse 4 and 5 says, he began to give them his attention. That was enough. Now look at Acts 4.13. This is another event, but l let me read it for you. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated, untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. There was a compelling witness. Even though they weren't preaching to them, there was confidence that they recognized. And then another one, Acts 5, 14. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their numbers to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. There was something about these apostles you couldn't ignore. 
There was a spirit, there was a presence about them. We need that today, don't we? Now, notice again, studying the works of Moses, notice that after he'd been with God, his face shone so much he had to wear a veil. Now, we don't see that, but I want to tell you something. When we've been with Jesus, really been with Jesus, it's going to show. Now, notice this was not a testimony of words, but of being. It's who we are, not what we say. He looked at them expecting something. Ask ourselves, what does a community or the world expect from the church today? The remarks we generally hear is that we're irrelevant. Oh, for that compelling witness. Now, the fourth element we find is committed resources. Now, first of all, they knew their own limitations. First thing they said, silver and gold, have I none? We're broke. We don't have anything. We too need to recognize our own limitations. You see, too often we try to meet a need on our own strength with or resources that we might have. Somehow we got to learn that we can never be adequate in our own strength or in what we have. But you see, with Peter and John, everything they had was at Christ's disposal. He, it all belonged to him. And they said, but what I do have, I give you. Back in chapter 2, verse 44, it says, all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. So there was a, there was a unity there. So there always needs to be unity because there will always be needs among us. There will always be that lame man, so to speak. In the book of Revelations, we see two different churches. Look at the statement made to them. First of all, the church at Smyrna. The Lord said to them, I know your poverty, but you are rich. But the other one, Laodicea, the last church he spoke to, he said, you say I'm rich and have need of nothing. You don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Which one are we? Thomas Aquinas said, no longer can we say silver and gold have I none. Neither can we say, rise up and walk. Committed resources. Now the fifth element we see is conquering authority. I like this one. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You see, amazing things can be accomplished in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about saying a prayer and then closing it with, we ask these things in your name. It's by what authority? The crowds could see the evidence, but they challenged the authority. Jesus challenged us to ask in his name. Now, what does that mean? It means within his will, his purpose, now, the Amplified Bible, I like what it says. It says, representing all that he is in his name. So it's, it's, it's not our resources. It's God. It's Jesus Christ. Conquering authority. Are we doing it in his authority or in our own efforts? Whenever I think of that authority, I used to work for a major corporation in management. And I used to sign in that particular facility 
I signed my name representing that company. I signed some pretty big checks. And I didn't have the money in the bank. But what I did had to be within the interest and purpose of the company. It was only valid not because of my signature, but by the authority of the company behind me. Have we lost the authority to accomplish great things for him? The final element that I see here is courageous faith. Now, think about this. Verses 7 to 10 says, He seized him by the right hand and raised him up. Now, think about the risk Peter took here. I can't help but thinking of another risk Peter took about getting in the boat, out of the boat to walk on the water. But he did because he took the risk. Here he seized him by the right hand and said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. He took the risk. He had a courageous faith. You see, even in this business of life, taking risk in his name results in greater wins. So we have to ask ourselves, have we lost our ability to take God at his word and take the risks in his name? So as we come to the, the end of this discussion. I firmly believe that if the church today would put these principles into practice, we too could see some exciting things happen. God would be glorified and the kingdom would grow. Think about these things. We need revival. We need to get back to some principles that bring about excitement within the church. Could these things that I've mentioned be those things we need to get back to? Thank you for joining us. Pray with me for the church in these days that will God restore it. <laughs>